Right, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name's Nick Clifton and I'm going to be talking to you about GCC plugins. Um, I realize this is the last talk of the day and everyone's tired and I'm tired, so I'm going to try and keep this short and sweet. I don't have a lot of points to make and I don't have a lot of slides, so we might get away early, you never know. Um, right, before I start, I have, an, I have a plan. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen of the cauldron of 2019, use GCC plugins. If there's one thing you take away from this conference, plugins should be it. Okay, so I'm not actually Baz Luhrmann, but I do like that quote. What happened, um, before I actually talk about the plugin, I should explain why we needed a plugin. So, a long time ago, well, not really, a, a couple of years ago in RHEL, in Red Hat Linux, we, Enterprise Linux, um, we decided we had it a need. We wanted to ensure that all the packages were built with the appropriate security options. We wanted to make sure that stack protection was enabled, um, that uh, we weren't using um, bind now, we, sorry, we weren't using lazy binding, we were using bind now, all these various other features. And we needed to make sure that all of our packages were built that way, and also we needed to be able to prove that packages had been built that way. It wasn't just enough to try and do it, we had to show that it had been done. So, the solution, was, the solution was fairly simple, at least for the first part. You add the necessary magic command line options, security flags, to your default build machinery, which for Red Hat was RPM. And then you also create a document describing these options so that package maintainers know what they need to use. If they're not using RPM, they've still got a document they can go to and say, ah, yes, this is what I need to be using. And then you create a tool that examines everything that's built and checks to see if the options were used. And this is the tool that will, you can then prove that you've done the right thing. Um, and you add the tool to your release management and the tool runs and says, yes, this package is safe, or no, this package has missed out options. Fine, should all be done. Problem solved. Well, no, there were problems. First of all, um, not all of the command online options get recorded when you do something like, say, dash G, um, what's the dwarf option, record dwarf? It, it doesn't actually record all of the options that use. And there are important ones like fortify source, which you want to be sure were used when the compilation happened, but don't get recorded in the produced binary. And because of things like uh, function attributes, you can turn off certain optimizations and security options on a per function basis. And you want to make sure this isn't done, or at least if it is done, it's done with agreed knowledge beforehand. So, we needed a way to capture all of the security and optimization options. It would work for, um, on a per function basis, so you can find out if functions are, are playing clever tricks. Um, it needed to work, uh, it needed to be compact, obviously, you don't want to make the binaries too, too, much, too bigger, and uh, it also needed to work with, we, we strip all of the binaries that get shipped. So we wanted something that would work even on a stripped binary, it would still record information on that binary without having to go and find the debug info, which may or may not be available. And the answer, of course, is a GCC plugin. GCC plugins are wonderful. <laughs> they, they can do lots of things, and they have access to lots of stuff inside GCC. All the, all the information, well, almost all the information we needed, we could get at. Um, they can add, I mean, this may not have been the intention when plugins were uh, designed for GCC or uh, when, the, when the interface was added, but plugins can actually add extra stuff to the object files that are being created. They can emit their own assembler, they can, uh, they can create new sections, they can do all kinds of fun things that maybe people didn't expect. Um, and they can work with multiple versions of GCC, including older versions of GCC. So you don't have to go and retrofit any uh, work that you've done to older, older GCCs. You just run the plugin, and it'll do the right thing. Well, in theory. <laughs> um, and also, another bonus point was that the plugins can, don't have to be part of the GCC repository. They could be maintained separately. They can be developed separately. They can have their own release cycle, whatever. You, you're not tied to what GCC is doing. Great. Sorry? Is there something new that not depending on a particular version of GCC? No. no, no plugins have all, well, since about GCC 4, I think. I they've they had failed a failed if you try to use it on a, you know, 
plugin for version five if you try to use it on version four? No. Um, well, <laughs> uh, you, plugins check the version of the GCC that they're running on against the version they were built with. So if you build a plugin for GCC five and then try to run it with GCC four, it should fail. Oh, okay, but if yeah. you've built it with GCC4, it will run with GCC4. So if you've got a GCC4 compiler to create your plugin in the first place, you've then got a plugin that will work with GCC4. And if you've got lots of versions of GCC, you just build the plugin for each version you want to use. Okay, okay. So okay? Changed. okay. But it's, you, and in theory, you can use the same plugin sources for all different versions. And you don't have to, well, we'll come on to that later, but there's actually some, some issues with that. So, in theory, the problem was solved, but there were a few problems. Here we go. So, this is what it's really all about. Um, things change inside GCC. Fair enough, it's being developed, it's being improved. And some of the, the functions and some of the macros that GCC has in, internally change their meaning and change their behavior depending on the version. So, for example, decal function name used to return a const cast r, it was used to return a string, but then it was changed to return a tree, which you then have to run identify pointer on it to get the name. So this means that with different, if you're compiling your plugin for different versions of GCC, you need to know about these differences in the, in the internals of GCC. Fortunately, GCC very kindly does provide you with a macro that tells you which version of GCC you're compiling your plugin for. So you can have conditional code in the plugin that handles all of this kind of thing. So it was, it was a bit of an issue, but not too bad. A bigger problem is that plugin, there is no well-defined interface between plugins and the internals of GCC. Plugins can actually do whatever they like, um, and they can do some pretty nasty things if you let them. And you, you can break very easily if you depend, if you muck about inside GCC. You can either break GCC, you can break the plugin, you can break the object, the file that's being created. So you do have to be very careful. Ah, and another problem related to this is that not only does GCC not have an interface for plugins to talk, to access its internals, it doesn't have an interface to let the plugins know what it is doing. Um, I, I had a particular problem that GCC would choose the output section that is generating, going to put code in without having any way of finding out what this choice was. And sometimes it would be .text, sometimes .text.hot, sometimes .text.startup. And th there isn't a way to find out, well, <laughs> there is if you really dig in deep. Um, but there's no easy, clean way to find out what, how these choices have been made and what, what's going to happen. So, ah, yes. Another issue, um, LTO is a, a great uh, device, but because the compilation process runs twice, the plugin runs twice. And the second time around, you've got less information available than you had the first time around. Uh, some, of the, some of the command line options have been dropped, um, various choices are, are no longer the same. And, I've, I came across a problem that I wanted to record the setting of um, the fortify minus d underscore fortify source macro on the command line. The first time round, it's there, you can see it, you can record it. The second time round, when the LTO compiler is invoked, it's disappeared. It's no longer present on the command line. But in theory, I could access it from the information stored in the object file that was generated during the first compilation process, except that that object file is being handled by a different plugin, and it's extracting information out of the object file and inserting it into the LTO compiler. But our, my plugin can't talk to that plugin to get the information out of that object file. <laughs> so um, that's a, an issue that I have not yet solved. I'm still working, still trying to find a, a good, clean way to fix it. And the other fun problem was the versioning problem. Because of the Anubin plugin, is meant as a, a, a security, is meant, is meant to be part of the build process to record information. So that means that when you build GCC, Anubin is actually invoked as part of the compilation process of GCC to record how GCC was built. Was it built securely? Okay, but let's say you update GCC. You can build it again, that's fine. But if you try and test the new GCC, 
it will fail because the version of the plugin that it's using is was for the old GCC, not the new GCC, right? Okay, you say, let's build a new, new version of the plugin. But in a build system like this, you don't install a newly built compiler until it's been tested successfully. So, but you can't test it successfully because the plugin version is different. So you can't test the new compiler, so you can't install the new compiler, so you can't use the new compiler to build the new plugin. Ah, what do you do? Well, what we do at the moment is we only check the major version. And if the minor version or the release number changes, the Anabin says, oh, well, I'm probably be all right. Yeah, let's carry on. It turns out this doesn't actually work very well in practice, but never mind. It does at least mean that you can build the compiler, test the compiler, install the compiler, and then rebuild the plugin. Um, one of the ways that I'm w working on getting around it is um, we're use, I'm thinking of using libabigail, which can provide a, um, a description of the, in, the, exposed, the, the interface that GCC exposes to its plugins. In theory, we have, this is still in development. And then I could record this description when the plugin is built, and then I can generate the description again when the plugin is run and compare the two, and if they're different, I can say, okay, something has changed, this, this is not, no longer safe to use the plugin, and the plugin could then do something intelligent like say, okay, I'll just disable myself and let the build finish and then re-enable itself, or something like that. Huh. So, I'm, I'm speeding through this mainly because I'm tired and I reckon everyone else is tired and we'd like to get home. So, yes, it works. It actually does, does work and it has proved to be useful. We're now using it in RHEL and Fedora. It's actually found problems in packages. It's found problems, uh, packages that use assembler that isn't um, correctly annotated or it's found problems with packages that use GCC and other compilers to produce their object files. So some of the objects are safe and some of them are they might, might be safe, they might not. It's actually working. It's great. Um, future development for the plugin. I've mentioned libabigail. Um, I'm also working on converting the plugin so it'll work with LLVM and record the information there. Um, a, a feature that I think would be great, but nobody else seems to like, is that the plugin could actually generate warning messages at the time the compilation is happening, saying, you have not enabled security option stack protection or whatever it is. So rather than a developer getting a message from the build system saying, hey, your package didn't pass the security tests after you've built it, you get a, back, a message at build time saying, you have not used dash F stack bound or stack check secure or whatever it is. Um, and more and more security options are being added all the time. I've just found out some new ones for ARCH64. So I intend to update the plugin to record the security options. Um, I haven't actually talked in this talk about the other side, which is the tool that then takes all the information that the Anabin plugin has recorded and analyzes it and produces errors or warnings. Um, but that obviously needs to be updated as well. When you, add, when you record new security options, you need to have the tool updated to look for those security options. Haha. So, um, this is partly an appeal from me. This, I, basically, this was all about me saying to the GCC community, please take plugins seriously. Don't treat us as second-class citizens. Don't just sweep us under the rug, but think about plugins. It would be really nice, for example, if there was a way to tell the wider community about people's plugins. If there was um, a, a, a page on the wiki where you could publish details about your plugin, or a directory in the repository where you could put your plugin, even if it's not officially maintained and not part of a distribution necessarily, just having somewhere where you can let people know about plugins and what they do and whether they want to be interested in them, that would be really nice. I'd particularly like to call out uh, Florian and Martin Cermak, who have been really helpful in getting this project off the ground and running. And there we are. It's, I've been talking for, what, 15 minutes? And we're at the end. So this was the world's fastest talk, I think. <laughs> um, and since obviously nobody has any questions, or, oh, oh dear, ah, we have questions. <laughs> so.
So I have a question about uh, the option G record GC switches, which is using debug info. What's, yes. what's the issue to not use it? There are two issues with that. First of all, it doesn't record all of the options. It doesn't record the, um, the dash D um, C, pre C preprocessor options. And those get recorded in the dwarf debug information, which is then split out into a separate debug file, which may not be available at the time you want to analyze an actual binary to see if it's safe or not, if it's been compiled with the right options. And do do analyze it at the end of package build? So that's the time when you should be able to also touch the or open the debug info. Yes, the, the, the tool that does the checking is, is able to um, load up the debug info if it's available, if it can be provided, and then it produces better results. But it does also work if you don't have the debug info available. Oh, sorry? Yes, yes, sorry, yes. I, I mentioned function attributes, but pragmas would also, yeah. can also muck about with that. So, so basically, just recording the options as they were on the command line is not enough because tricks can be played to turn off security or change security. Uh, the reason, I think the re main reason why we don't put uh, the minus D options into the GCC record options was that often people put uh, file names and stuff like that into mm -hmm. into yep. the macros on the command line and then 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 the string changes yes. everywhere oh, yeah. all the I, time. I'm sure and there are good reasons for it. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying and, it's and another reason why this tool is helpful because it does record them. It records also, the ones we're interested in, not yeah. all of them. Also, another reason was that we have the minus G3, mm -hmm. which actually records the macros, so there is a, already a way to put that. but. We found that uh, even after a lot of effort, uh, the G3 is, is still too large for right. actually yes. distributing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you, uh, you check your marks only uh, as a separate uh, stage during build procedure. I mean, uh, we have local patches. We added checks to both build time linker and runtime loader to check binaries if they have appropriate marks mm -hmm. with your plugin. And it's quite useful uh, when we try to ensure compatibility within system or something like that. Oh, yes, I'm, and I'm glad you're using it. it, it uh, I was always hoping that other people would be able to take it and use it for other things, so, yes. Um, you are asking people to write more GCC plugins. Yes. All right. Um, I have seen the same request sometimes from maintainers mm -hmm. in the development mailing list, like, have you considered to do whatever you are suggesting to do in a plugin, yep. which makes full sense. But then, how do you deploy your plugin? I mean, I put my stuff in a mm -hmm. GCC plugin. Now, next question is, how can I make people to actually find my stuff? So how are you deploying an of Yes. In its own package? Uh, um, OK, well, obviously, GCC has a built-in known directory that it will search for, for, for plugins. So if you do dash F plugin equals name, it will go and look, look in uh, some pre-configured directory for that plugin. So providing you've installed your plugin to that directory, you can then use it. Um, if you want to tell, how do you tell people that it's there, that's kind of up to you. Um, but it's also part of the point I'm trying to make here is that if plugins were actually regarded as a, um, and a serious part of GCC, then there all, we could have some way of publishing details about plugins uh, and, and use, potential users would be able to find out about, oh, look, there's a plugin that does this extra feature or, um, uh, I don't know. Um, and, oh, but it, that does remind me that one other useful thing with plugins is that you can use them for developing a new optimization pass, a new feature. And once you've got it working, you could then take the code and put it, re turn it into a patch for GCC. It doesn't have to stay as a plugin forever, but it does provide a way of developing new features or new op optimizations without having um, to uh, 
be tightly integrated with the GCC at the time you're doing the development. Hello, Nick. Oh. Uh, thinking back to our earlier conversation about encouraging junior, you know, coming up mm. members into the community, yes. are there obvious patches that, or features that you would like to see added that maybe somebody new to the community could embark upon? Um, the, the, the using plugins would be very helpful, I think, to somebody new to try and start development, depending on what it is they're trying to do. Because plugins allow you to access to the internals of GCC, that's great in the amount of power and information that's available, but you need to know what you're doing. But you don't have to if the purpose of the plugin is something that's not a deep dive into GCC. So um, if, for example, your plugin was designed to count the number of instructions that get generated, uh, it could do that without having to know all about all the different optimization passes or how to decode Gimple. It could probably look much lower down. So it is, it is a potential way for new developers to experiment and play with GCC without having to get too dirty, depending on what it is they're trying to do. And in Anavin specifically, any features that would be good for someone to tackle? Oh, um, <laughs> there the probably are. Um, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, what would be? Um, one thing that might be interesting, for example, is adding a new warning type. Um, because you should be able, you should be able to do that um, and just have a look at the high level, uh, maybe the preprocess code or maybe the high level IR before it gets too deep. Um, off the top of my head, I really can't think of anything straight away, but it, it has the potential. Yes. Anyone else? So I'm oh. may have I was late to the uh, beginning of the talk, so you may have talked about it, but I'm curious. Um, what are um, some of the issues that you ran into in terms of the stability of the uh, GCC API or ABI? Well, the, the main issues there isn't. Well, no, there is an API, but it's very primitive. It basically it's a startup and then allows you to register callbacks to be called at various different places. There isn't an API for accessing internal structures inside GCC. You just you just get them. You just grab about and you can muck about with them. You can change them if you want to. Um, and one of the things I would like to see is a proper API with a defined way of get, reading, getting data and, and possibly changing it and recording who, that it was the plugin that changed it, for example. Um, hang on, I'm trying to... <laughs> what else was the question? So oh. um, about the stable stable API, right, for plugins, yes. um, we want... I mean, when... We initially thought about the idea of having and allowing plugins. There was one group of us, of the community, that, that basically wanted, yes, let's do that, but let's do it properly. Let's mm -hmm. design an API for that. Yep. What happened is then it just basically we installed all headers and everything is free, go, free to go, right? So that, that's what our API now is. Yes. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, there's some resistance to actually creating a, a, a sensible and stable API mm. for, for the usual FSF fear of, you know, sneaking yeah. in yes. proprietary stuff. Um, maybe the discussion would be different if, that, if somebody would sit down and actually design and write a stable API. For instance, one, the usual answer is start with an introspection API. Yes. I mean, that's not... Too, Iterate over all function, iterate over all basic blocks, iterate over all instructions, iterate over all operands, mm -hmm. and, then, and iterate over all local variables and so on. Yes. So that's not too difficult to design, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we could start yep. easy. Um, and if that would exist, then maybe the discussion with the SF, FSF would be easier yes. to see, you know, that. but it's really useful, so let's do it anyway, even, even yeah. for your fears. But yeah. uh, so far, nobody sat down to do that. Maybe also because of the FSF resistance. Yeah. So. As part of the GCC Python plugin, but it's in yeah. Python. So if you want to do it in Python, there is some kind of stable API. Okay. Regarding the implementation of a more usable API then, uh, yes. what are you doing next Tuesday? <laughs> Tuesday, I don't think I have anything important to do on Tuesday. <laughs> some, some boring meeting, I think. Anyone else? Right, it looks like we can go home early. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, hang. Oh, oh, again. Is there a registry of GCC plugins?
Because I have some plugins that they use at work. Mm -hmm. Like I have one that we use internally in order to uh, bisect uh, um, GCC uh, passes. So if you have an ICE, for example, then you can mark one specific function. Mm -hmm. And then you can, uh, the plugin deactivates the GCC passes one by one. Two, 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 two. So it can tell you, you know, Often, it can tell you exactly what is the optimization pass that is causing the problem. Yeah. I, I, we would love to share that. Um, is there some place on the wiki or something? I confess I have not looked. Uh, I don't think there is. I, mean, I, I would wish there was. I would very much like to see that. Um, in fact, one of the things I'm taking away from this conference is I'm going to try and get a blog in for the wiki and then start adding things to it. OK, if you get it started, I will submit this right. first entry. Okay. Yeah. I That's a deal. Okay. Anyone else? No? Right. Everyone, we can go home. Yay. Thank you very much. <laughs>